It is another roundtable discussion of medical questions from a variety of sources. Our panel of doctors provides the answers. The doctors are on call tonight. Funding for On Call is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call, starting its 11th year of opening doors for important medical information. And by... The South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. Hello and welcome to On Call Television. Tonight our show is all about you and whatever topic you'd like us to discuss. We repeat this kind of ask anything topic three or four times a year because we sense that you like it. I mean the call in questions come in fast and furious when we do this, telling us that you're watching. The best part is that we cannot anticipate what you will ask and sometimes we don't have the answers. We are not afraid to say we don't know, but the guests we invite are always pretty good at it, generalists with a broad base of medical knowledge. Generally, we have some kind of response to your varied questions, and then again, sometimes you stump us. I'm challenging you to stump us. The questions come in in all sizes, from treating toenail trouble to dealing with worldwide epidemics, from avoiding antibiotics for the cold to preventing or dealing with a heart attack. We will go where you want and we'll do our best to respond, but this is your show and it depends on your questions and directions. Tonight, you are the director of our show. So where do we go? Where do you want us to go? We have to call, you have to call or email your questions to help us. Call 1-888-376-6225, 1-888-376-6225, or email us at oncalltelevision.com and go to the questions button. Most questions come late, so your best shot at being heard is your, you to call early, so please call. And to try to their hand at your questions, we have two great guests and good friends. Dr. K Dr. Kathy Liedebrand completed medical school training at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha, Nebraska. She also fulfilled an internal medicine residency at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in Omaha and was an associate chief resident there. She moved to Watertown, joined the Brown Clinic and practiced outpatient and hospital internal medicine until about a year ago when she became an exclusive hospitalist at the Watertown Prairie Lakes Hospital. I've gotten to know her through the South Dakota chapter of the ACP and listened to her eloquent presentations at those meetings. Dr. Robert Summerer completed medical school training at the University of Osteopathic Medicine and Health Sciences in Des Moines, Iowa. He also fulfilled a general surgical residency at Des Moines General Hospital. He moved to Madison, South Dakota, became a part of the Madison Community Hospital and the Eastern Plains Surgical Department there. He sometimes covers the Brookings Hospital Surgical Service and through the years has proved superb surgical care to, and provided surgical care to, to shared and numerous patients with me. Thank you both for joining us tonight on the Ask Anything show. Um, Rob, tell me first, uh, you're a general surgeon. That's right. What is it that made you go into general surgery? 
Well, actually, before I went into my, my residency training, I worked for three years with the Indian Health Service uh, here in South Dakota. Oh. And uh, I found during that time that I really enjoyed uh, the things that involved doing things with my hands and, and things that I could really take care of. I found myself also frustrated with those things I couldn't fix, and, and uh, there's something in me that enjoys being able to fix things, and then if I can't, I can pass them on to somebody who, who, <laughs> who, who, who deals deal with, deal with the long-term type of <laughs> issues. That, that and where was it that you were at the Indian Health I was down in Wagner. Uh, here in South Dakota. Yeah. Yeah. And you're from where originally? I'm from Norfolk, Nebraska, so kind of on the other side of the border there. All right. Mm -hmm. So, and tell us a little bit about what you, why did you decide to go into an uh, internal medicine residency, Kathy? Um, well, I, I found that I was interested in all diseases. I had trouble just honing in on one, and, and I uh, love to back off and see the whole patient. Um, I, it seems like you study one body system and it you, you you just it just can't help but relate to another the heart and the kidney work and and uh, together and the brain and the the bowels and so uh, this was the place always I the bowels to be. Yeah. and and <laughs> I guess right. in internal medicine we're kind of like Sherlock Holmes we love to dig in and really try to uh, get look at all the symptoms and tie it all together so all right I'm gonna throw another question at you and I'll start with you Kathy so you're, you've been practicing just a few short years. You're a very young doctor. Mm -hmm. But you've seen changes, and you see changes coming. Yeah. Reflect on that. Um, medicine has got, I've, I've personally experienced a lot of change. Uh, medicine has uh, made wonderful strides in curing disease. When I was in residency, we had so many people in the, in the hospital that were what we called cardiac cripples. Yeah. And they would have a heart attack and another heart attack and, and you just didn't have the medicines to fix them or the stents to open their arteries. And it seemed like uh, in a few years, uh, medicines came out, uh, techniques changed, and suddenly we've got people surviving heart attacks and living years and uh, good active lives. Uh, so that's one thing that, that's changed, I think, for the better. Um, with complexity, I, I personally found that I was having trouble uh, doing it all. I, I was increasingly torn in so many directions throughout the day uh, as far as uh, dealing with hospital patients, outpatients, paperwork, nursing home patients. And uh, as our community grew and we had more specialists come in, uh, in our community, I, it was right for us to make the move to uh, have hospitalists. And so that's one area where I think patients are seeing that change too. Uh, in the bigger communities, especially, there's uh, more of a division of labor. There's the some outpatient, outpatient physicians and inpatient physicians, and um, I think time for the physicians is is uh, it's been a survival tactic for the, both the physicians, and I think in some ways the patients get sometimes more focused care, but uh, personally and for my patients, there's that that heartache of, of letting go of some long-term relationships and being able to take care of, of uh, the patient both as an outpatient and prevent uh, problems and then as an inpatient uh, in their most vulnerable times. So. And, and the, the, the weakness in this system I would reflect, and of course I haven't been in a hospital system. We don't have that yet in Brookings, it, but it, it spread throughout the country right now. I mean, and, and it's spreading more. But I think the weakness is the loss of continuity. Mm -hmm. And although you still have continuity in, in Watertown because you know everybody, I mean, there's that con connection. And it may not be always the case in a larger town, and I worry about mm -hmm. that part of it. I'm, yeah. I worry about it too, and I'm thankful that I've had 13 years uh, doing clinic work because I think it'd be much more difficult to do it without having had that experience. So. Yeah. Rob, what, what changes do you think uh, you've seen in this, these short years that you've been practicing and, and uh, radically changed the practice well, of medicine? Yeah, in my area of medicine, um, there's just a, a uh, an incredible in, uh, in improvement in the technology that's available. And, and I'm thinking uh, when I go to laparoscopy, when I was in training, we were doing gallbladders laparoscopically. And um, now we're doing colon surgery, we're doing um, 
you know, appendix is almost primarily laparoscopically, and, and, and then there's so many other things that are done gynecologically in the, in the field of urology that, uh, um, that minimally invasive type thing. And, and we constantly see upgrades in the technology that's available, and that allows us to go further places and, and, and with a degree of safety that is, that is, um, that is also good for that too. And, and then now we're going into the world of robotic surgery. And, and I suspect, you know, when we look down the way that we're going to see some remote surgery that's done robotically and, and, and that I think that technology will continue to improve. That's very interesting. Remote <laughs> meaning that the robot, the guy, there is a surgeon, not a robot that's doing the surgery, right. but they're doing it uh, uh, on an artificial spot or with on the camera, and the robot is in the other room, and or, now it could be in the other or state. The other state, yes, or the mm -hmm. other country. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah to talk a little bit about laparoscopic. I mean, what okay. is a laparoscopic? Uh, gallbladder. Well, right. Well, when we use that term, it, it, it involves the laparoscope is actually a term for a special camera that has a light that goes inside the belly. And so typically that's, um, that's accessed with a very small incision as opposed to an open incision where we have a large uh, incision and, and we look visually without a camera. And so um, any procedure, like a gallbladder surgery is a very common surgery that we do laparoscopically, we use those very small incisions then to, uh, to be able to see and then also use small instruments to do the, the work. It's really something to see. So you, you make a hole at the, um, the belly button right. and there's a, there's a, you blow it up with a gas and this light goes in that points it in and you've got a camera that's acting and one of the assistants is holding that and two other sites, tiny little holes, and you go in and you have your grasping equipment. And so instead of having all of this exposure to infection, you have these two little holes and these two little, these, um, this camera and the enlargement of what you can see. And it's just amazing to watch you guys do this kind of a thing. And, and the visualization has improved so much. It's, it's just a beautiful picture that we work with now. And so yeah. <clears throat> it really gives us access to see things. And in many times seeing things that we aren't able to see or feel um, with an open incision. And so yeah. and many times it's very superior. It's superior, although there's a time when you want to put your hand on it, <laughs> don't you? And you do, you can cut Absolutely. open, put your hand in, and you do that, a, 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 a laparoscopic assisted, hand assisted, exactly. colon, mm -hmm. colon, uh, colon, colon, resection. colon resection. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the phones are ringing off the, okay. the wall here, and so we're going to start <coughs> with this. Vision vitamins beneficial. Hmm. Uh, I can take some of that. Yeah. I, I, it's controversial. I was just reviewing that actually the other day, and while a lot of people are spending a lot of money on these vitamins, I, I don't believe the there's a lot of evidence yet that can show that there's uh, improved outcomes. Yeah, I, I think that the study that has brought everybody to be, to use lutein is like seven patients. I mean, it's just it, it, and uh, and the uh, increased doses of zinc and the increase you know the other things that have been promoted as this vision are very poorly done studies. Nobody's re replicated them, and the Bosch and Lohm people just to name the company that has done this, uh, you know, and we just promote the heck out of these expensive pills and really what it might be is it's just a multiple vitamin and we really don't have good scientific data. My personal bias is 2,000 of vitamin D, maybe a vi mixed vitamin, uh, multivitamin if you're not eating well and that's it. What? Even, yeah, even multivitamin is not a lot of great evidence to show that that, that improves in the average American diet. And probably the best way we can get our vitamins is from a good balanced diet. Uh, right, I, actually I've been saying no uh -huh. multiple vitamins for the reg regular person. For a person who has vision problems, okay, a multiple vitamin. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have vision problems and you have, just eat a mixed, good yeah. balanced diet. Yeah, I feel sorry for people spending an awful lot of their income on these on the vitamins. So, Rob, any comment about vitamins and eye eye vision? And no. Well, not not really. But it, you know, I, I did see a study recently that discussed vegetable use in in South Dakotans, and and we're at the bottom of the list about vegetable use Terrible. in the country. Yeah. And and we're meat and potatoes con or state, and and we really need to find more ways to get vegetables and fruit into our into our diet. All right. I think that parents who realize you've got to do what five fruits and vegetable, mm -hmm. five fruits, something like that. I mean, you know, put the grapes out, put the oranges out, don't Absolutely. put the sweets out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You can have something if, until you've eaten your, your fruits. <laughs> there you go. Uh, neuropathy of feet, pills cause dizziness. Is there anything else that I can help me? 
So neuropathy. A lot of people take a variety of different medicines. I, the classic vitamin, or I mean, uh, treatment was amitriptyline, simple little low cost medicine. Then it's moved to gabapentin, and then it's now Lyrica, which is gabapentin like. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's some argument that the, uh, the Lyrica is better for the neuropathy of diabetes primarily. But it is a massive drug that is an an actually originally an anesthesia drug. Uh, I, I'm very conservative with this. I think the most important thing with neuropathy is you make sure that you know where your feet are and you take really good care of your feet and know that you, when you've got bad feeling in your feet, there's not much to do for yeah, it. Yeah, I, I, neuropathy can be miserable for people and if it interferes with their sleep and anything that interferes with your sleep interferes with your quality of life. And the way I put it is anything that helps with nerve pain or nerve discomfort will calm down the biggest nerve, the brain. Yeah. And I, I, I often will prescribe gabapentin, but whenever I do, it starts, start low and go slow. It's yeah. poor grammar, but it but rhymes at least. I, and I like it uh, as well, and I'm not uh -huh. a big Lyrica treater, but I'll use it mm -hmm. when we've failed gabapentin, which mm -hmm. is much, much cheaper. And uh, Tylenol, well, it's got a bad name because of potential for liver damage, but it actually can be helpful for nerve pain. And a lot of people say, well, Tylenol doesn't help my, my pain. But yeah. for nerve pain, uh, if you don't go over what's recommended on the bottle and you realize that Tylenol's in a lot of other over-the-counter medicines, uh, Tylenol can be helpful at, at bedtime, for instance, to help you sleep. No more than 3,000 milligrams a day. Right, that's changed. Uh, all right, any other co comment? No, not at all. All right. Uh, what are symptoms of trouble with pancreas, and how would you know? Uh, yeah, I, I can <laughs> jump into that area. Um, well, when you're considering pancreatitis, um, then that you know that's something that's going to give you pretty intense pain in the upper part of the abdomen. It can be band-like, where it'll go across the upper part of the abdomen. It also can bore through to the back, and 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 uh, you know classically that is how it's described as far as pancreatitis. Now there's lots of conditions that can happen with the pancreas um, where there's disease and there's no symptoms whatsoever, and and uh, that's one of the the downfalls of pancreatic cancer is that um, no clue they don't tend to have any any kind of uh, symptoms associated that with that until it's more advanced disease. <clears throat> I always take the hint when there is an elevated blood sugar to think about the pancreas as a, a source and. A clue, but boy, it sneaks up, and then suddenly mm -hmm. you've got metastatic, widely metastatic, untreatable right. pancreatic cancer. Right. Pancreatitis, most of the time, it's due to n you don't know. Exactly. Fifty percent <clears throat> of the time, the twenty-five uh, percent of the time, it's it's alcohol, and twenty-five percent it's gallbladder disease. Exactly. Right? Is that mm -hmm. is that the I is that that's, that's the old numbers mm -hmm. when I was? Mm -hmm. There's rare causes like isn't a scorpion bite uh, uh, one cause and yeah. some other. <laughs> Well, but, and, yeah. and there's recently there's all this triglyceride stuff, but it's not that. I've just read an mm -hmm. article that says that triglycerides is not as big a risk as we thought mm -hmm. it was. Have you heard that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can dizziness be caused by allergies, and what causes vertigo? Hmm. Well, that's that's your good yeah. question. <laughs> um, dizziness. Well, I, this is a kind of an interesting question. I heard one time uh, that there were four major causes of dizziness. You can kind of divide it into those. Okay. Um, one. One. Well, dizziness that's like lightheadedness is, uh, can be from the heart if you have a heart irregularity or not pumping well. Um, or there, blood pressure's yeah, low or so your blood pressure Cardiac, medicines. yeah. But heart. Um, neuro, neurovascular or neurogenic. So if your nerves don't ha help your blood vessels uh, constrict or uh, when you stand up uh, to raise your blood pressure, but also vertigo can kind of fall into that range because okay. if you have a, you have the nerve that uh, goes to your inner ear and you've got canals in there that govern balance. Uh, and vertigo is a more of a spinning sensation or a, a sensation that either you're spinning or that the room or your surroundings are moving. Okay, now we got one minute and this is great. Okay. We're gonna go two hours yep. on this. So what more? Well, what, let's see. So we've got, um, let's see, there Neurogenic was. Neurogenic and we've Neurogenic, got heart. Neurogenic, heart, okay. and vertigo. Then, Anxiety is one of them. Okay. Uh, and I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I think that there's this inner ear thing that's that's outside the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think it was actually neurogenic, heart, vertigo, and then anxiety. Okay. Um, and that's so, a good, uh, but the majority so, of the twirling is 
virus, right? Yep. And so that's where sinusitis can come in, or a sinus infection, or cold because and you can. Allergies yep. And allergies. allergies. If you get, <clears throat> uh, if you get increased fluid in the inner ear, it's tickling those nerves and making them activate when, when they shouldn't be. All right. And that makes you feel like you're moving and dizzy. All right. Well, depending upon what medical concerns you may have, a series of treatments to rehabilitate may be in order. Tammy Watson interviewed Dr. Jim Hoff, who specializes in physical medicine and rehabilitation at the VA Medical Center in Sioux Falls about regular exercise. Dr. Hoff, you said that the one thing that can help me see my doctor less often and keep me healthier is what? Regular exercise. It's that simple? It's nothing hard. It's very easy, actually. Um, the government came out with a rec recommendation, basically, one hour of exercise daily. It doesn't matter if it's walking, swimming, whatever. It's just regular exercise. I think the biggest thing that we've done as a group is uh, gotten more technological. I, my grandfather probably consumed 3,000 calories a day as a dairy farmer. He worked real hard skinny as a rail, but we don't work hard as a group anymore. We don't get out as much. Yeah, we sit behind desks and work on computers all day, that so many of us do. Um, do you have tips to help those of us like that, getting out, to get out and get active? I'll tell you what I tell my patients on there. Regular exercise helps maintain the heart, other bodily functions on a regular basis. You don't have to do it all at once. 15 minutes, morning, noon, a night or at least spaced out. If you do an hour split up or all at once, it doesn't matter. You do like to get up to the point of just a fine sweat. Not heavy, but just fine. Everything's working. If a patient has some chronic health problems and is sort of out of shape, for, for example, somebody that's maybe dealing with diabetes and is a little overweight, uh, what's the best way for them to start changing the course of their health and being more active? Ultimately, I tell them to start in slowly, five, 10 minutes, and do what you can tolerate. For that case, I tell them you want to go 20 minutes at least, and that's endurance conditioning. So you want to get at least one block a day of 20 minutes. Everything after that, short of that's what they, um, uh, there's two types of training, endurance and then heavy bulking. The heavy bulking is done under short term or aerobic, but uh, the endurance is what most people have to be fit and tone. That's a 20 minute stretch minimum. Is there anything else about exercise that you really want our audience to understand? Um, regularly, start off easy. It gradually builds up with time. As it improves over time, bring a buddy system, your success rate's much higher. Uh, don't be afraid to get out. Thank you, Dr. Hoff. Those are some good words of wisdom for us. Welcome back to On Call. Tonight we have Dr. Kathy Liedebrand with Watertown Prairie Lakes Hospital and Dr. Robert Summerer with the Madison Community Hospital as our guests. Thank you very much for being here. Please call in your questions about tonight's topic. Call 1-888-376-6225. You may also email them on to questions at OnCallTelevision.com, all one word, on call television. So we have a call. Uh, what is the difference between uh, an MD and a DO? Well, well, you know, anymore, the, the difference, you don't see a whole lot of difference. Uh, traditionally, I think there was a difference in some of the, uh, the concept of, of the uh, philosophy of, of the training. Um, we, we talk about the, the term allopathic, which is, refers to an MD, and an osteopathic uh, refers to a DO. And uh, um, with the DO, there was a lot of um, training uh, uh, where there was discussion of, of structure, um, creates the right function. So if everything's in the right structure, then the function is going to fall into place. And so traditionally, um, there is a, a, a training um, which is somewhat like chiropractic, where you're getting the body in line, but um, it goes beyond that into all the other structures of the body too, and if they're in line, then, then the thought is that, that the body will function correctly. Um, and then um, as far as medications, uh, uh, um, less of a, of a um, 
Emphasis. Emphasis, that. yeah, yeah, than what you might see in an allopathic training. Um, but like I said, anymore, the, the trainings uh, are, are very similar. And half of your mm -hmm. people who taught you were MDs. I mean, Absolutely. You, you had mm -hmm. it, it, we it. We trained with, I t had several DOs in my residency program, yeah. and we. I think yeah. that so it's there's just a lot of. It, through the years, it's just. Boundaries are blurred. Yeah, Absolutely. it's gone. Mm -hmm. It's the same. Mm -hmm. uh, what uh, about influenza A? This person had. Influenza A, dry heaves, can't keep fluids down, dehydration, what should be doing? Now it sounds to me that this person has two things because influenza is not a GI illness. Right. We always, we make a misnomer when we say, I've got the GI flu, because it isn't a flu. Flu is respiratory, flu is a cough. The classic mm -hmm. influenza, A or B, is uh, one or two or three days of aches, feel horrible, like the world's gonna end, everything hurts and there's a sore throat and you have a fever and then it goes into a cough for two weeks. Mm -hmm. Would you describe it differently? No. At A or B, which is the difference? Well, um, I know that B only infects humans and A can be in birds and I think I pigs. think that's it, yeah. Pigs too, I believe. Pigs and other animals, so. other, yeah. Mm -hmm. so. <clears throat> but the... And A can be, B can be less severe too, it typically is, but... Okay. Uh, we're seeing both. I've, we've had both up in Watertown. Yeah, we have too. The dry heave, so if this person has the viral gastroenteritis, probably a norovirus, the mm -hmm. Norwalk virus or one of the GI viruses, mm -hmm. so that's not treatable with an antibiotic. That's not treatable. Either is influenza A or B, mm -hmm. except if you can catch it very, very early, and generally we're not treating using the influenza Tamiflu anyway, are you? Not. It, it usually only shortens the the course by about a day, day. a day or two. <laughs> For now, a cost of and it's eight, pretty expensive, mm -hmm. isn't it? Well, what is it, 80 to 150 dollars, somewhere okay. in that range. Yep. Uh, but this is viral gastroenteritis. But I was gonna say that we get, one thing I, I like to focus sometimes on unnecessary hospitalizations and people that could save themselves from landing in the hospital. And we, uh, with either gastroenteritis or the flu, um, if you're older and you're on, for instance, a lot of water pills or diuretics, one mistake people sometimes make is they, they aren't drinking much, they're keeping nothing down, but they make sure they take, take their, their diuretic. water pills. <laughs> and, yeah. and so those are the ones that will come in really sick. And so sometimes uh, you'll get sick from the medications being more concentrated. The ones you're normally on can make you nauseated, yeah. whereas the, the levels go high. I like think they're, they're, digoxin's another one um, that will yeah, Make and metformin sick. is Met another one. Yeah. So if you get viral gastroenteritis and you're diarrhea and vomiting and you're or, or really sick and you're not able to drink or take up normal mm -hmm. hydration, or fever over 100, you, you, you're going to probably talk to your doctor on the phone and say, "I want to hold off on my diuretics. I want to hold off on my metformin. I want to hold off on my digoxin. Those are three important group mm -hmm. groups of drugs. In, mm -hmm. th I think that's take." Or, or go in and, or that might be a reason to go in and get checked out. Right. Um, because you're a little more vulnerable and you may not get through a viral illness as well as someone who's younger and on no medication. So the real question is, uh, when do you know to go with an antibiotic for the influenza A respiratory infection? I always say that first day or two of fever doesn't count. You're going to get over it and the whole thing will run its course. You'll hack and cough for two weeks whether you use an antibiotic or not. It makes no difference except if you use an antibiotic, you're gonna cause yourself a lot of potential problems. But day five, a person mm -hmm. starts developing another fever. That could be pneumonia because almost all bacterial pneumonias follow a viral uh, 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 infection. Mm -hmm. So then you need to really come in. Those are the people who can die. Yeah, and the people initially again, who are asthmatic or on, on immune suppressants like steroids or treatment for rheumatoid arthritis, they tend to get more ill even with the flu. Or the biologics. And, yeah. Those bi and sometimes they can benefit from things aside from antibiotics uh, like nebulizer sure. treatments or steroid to help help the wheezing or right. that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Right. But, right. but for the general population, yeah, waiting that five days, seeing if it's and if you've got the viral gastroenteritis, wash your hands, wash your hands. The hand sanitizer doesn't work so well for those as they do for the respiratory. And uh, realize you just, the treatment is don't eat for a day. Dr drink clear liquids uh, when, as soon as you can and, and uh, go with clear liquids for another day. And then add a very low, spicy, low fat, 
kind of a mm. bananas, rice, applesauce, toast kind of diet. Absolutely. Can I throw something yeah. in from a surgery standpoint? It's something that's, that's really important to keep in mind that if you do have some of those other infections going on, that's not a good time for your, for your elective surgery. And, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> well, and, and we laugh when a lot of people are upset because we have busy lives yeah. and, and we plan for a surgery or a particular time for it. And, and I feel badly when, when some of those, those get canceled mm -hmm. on someone, but it is much safer for the surgery itself and potential complications afterwards um, if it's done when you're completely healthy. And so. Mm -hmm. So we're going to run through fast questions because they're just okay. rolling in. Thank you very much. <laughs> Is it wise for patients to research symptoms or illnesses on the internet? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'd say yes. I, I, I think there's just a, a really a fount of knowledge that can be brought. And that's one of the things that has really changed in medicine, I think, over the last they several years is, is access to that. Yeah. And, and there are some good sites that uh, patients can do. Mm -hmm. You have to be careful and, and uh, recognize that some information on the Internet is inaccurate. But uh, I'm just going <laughs> to throw out a few good sites. E-Medicine, uh, Medscape, acponline.org. Medline, uh, uh, Medlineplus.gov is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. And up to date has a lot of patient education too. Great. So. All right. Would you say those again? Well, uh, I think I said e-medicine. Give me your favorite one. E-medicine. Probably e-medicine. E I'm, I'm going to say the CDC. The CDC I site is fantastic right. too. All right. And I like Medline, uh, Medlineplus.gov. Uh, here's from Canton, multiple uh, spine surgeries will get better with age or get worse? Ooh, that's a tough question. People who have back surgery can sometimes get into a pain, chronic pain cycle, and if, if they're still hurting after the surgery, and they often are, the best thing they can do is to get moving and get going with their normal life and, and rehab if you can't and stick with any... I, I uh, back pain is just one of those. It, it, mm. There's so many people coming in. I see how it affects their life, and we f we focus on the acute crisis, and I think, and and you want an easy fix, and there isn't. Mm -hmm. This is one where Benjamin Franklin's quote, "Time is the best healer." I, I really think sometimes time is the best healer for back pain. But the the flip side is that. Uh, people sometimes forget about preventing the next back injury and that core strengthening and learning how to properly lift and avoid repeated bending. That's probably more important than any medicines or, or surgery. Right. That. I, I agree. Couldn't be said nicer. Uh, bladder prolapse, if it's not bothering her, is it okay to live with a bladder that prolapses? I would say, as far as that goes, the, the concern would be bladder infections, and, and mm -hmm. if, uh, if she's not having bladder infections, then... Then it's okay. Now, and the and there's also is. vaginal prolapse, right. and then it gets out there, and it dries out, and it gets irritated, and there's a higher risk of cancer in that group. And but then that's going to probably bring the person... People tend to come in pretty quickly once it gets to that point it's where right. it's external, and uh, I, I think most times I would I always recommended that they go they go in, they go in at that point I would fix it I mm -hmm. you know and what uh, what we're saying by prolapse is you know the vagina is like a, a tube uh, and what happens is it turns inside out and it comes out uh, okay so I, and that's a surgical thing uh, or, or you can use it with some pessaries there's some pessaries which is a you I what is a thought, pessary? I always, well, <laughs> I, I personally thought I'm thinking a man must have invented pessaries. <laughs> I don't. I I know that they're out there and that they may be helpful for someone who just can't be a surgical candidate. But, but not a fun. I, I will I will not go into pessaries. I did not invent them. Okay. <laughs> okay. My son was diagnosed with sarcoidosis and has had problems with shortness of breath, but is asymptomatic now. Without symptoms now, what are the chances it will resurface and affect other organs? Is it possible that it's gone away permanently? And I will answer that one. It's possible that it won't return. It's a great, it's a great pretender. It can do a lot of different things. Sarcoidosis is kind of like TB, only it's not an infection. It can occur in the lungs, but it can occur like an infection in the brain. It can occur in skin spots. It can occur in a variety of different ways. I had a lady who had what is called erythema multiforme. She would have these rashes on her four, her uh, lower legs, and they would come in these nodules, mm -hmm. and it was sarcoidosis by biopsy. Yeah. 
I, we had, um, I, th I believe it, the ones I've had, I've only had a few cases up here where they were self-limited. They had some nodules in their lungs and, and mm -hmm. it acted like an infection. And maybe someday there will be a, we'll an infection. We'll know that it was an infection. Um, but but they, they, they got, both of them got better at, they, uh, after a few months or a year uh, and the x-ray went back to normal. Down in Nebraska where I trained, we have a major liver transplant program and uh, there were quite a few liver transplants for our sarcoidosis and it was mostly the African American liver. population that really yeah. tends to have worse disease. Any um, thought about sarcoidosis? I really don't. I'm okay, that's an internal know. medicine doctor yeah. kind of a thing, isn't it? Yeah, and the case that I had, we treated it with steroids, it'd go away. And then it later it came back, we'd treat it with steroids, it'd go away, and then it would much later came back, treated with steroids, hasn't come back. Often, as we age, we experience different medical concerns. Tammy Watson interviewed Dr. David Sandvik, who heads the geriatrics department at USD Sanford School of Medicine about the Geriatrics Fellowship. Dr. Sandvik, you just told me you're the new program director for the Geriatric Fellowship. Explain what this is. Well, uh, a fellowship uh, leads to specialization. Uh, it's after a residency which occurs after medical school. So a physician will go through medical school and then through some type of residency uh, and then possibly into a fellowship that, for example, if you're in internal medicine might lead to cardiology or pulmonology or endocrinology. And one of the fellowships that uh, you can add to that is geriatrics. Uh, and we accept um, uh, fellows from either internal medicine or family medicine residencies. Now, geriatrics is medicine for older individuals, correct? Yes. What is unique about that? How is that separate from younger adults? Maybe the most unique thing is how complex it is. Um, <clears throat> so that all of us who are getting up in age, and I can speak now from experience, <laughs> have very few of us have a single medical problem. Uh, oftentimes we're being treated for many medical problems and ger geriatricians have been referred to as complexivists. So we deal with very complex uh, situations where treating one problem might exacerbate or make another problem worse. Um, we deal with uh, more with function, how to keep people able to do what they need to do. Uh, and sometimes that means adding medicine, sometimes it means taking it away. Uh, it takes a great deal of knowledge to know geriatric pharmacology, um, how we fit in, for example, with insurance programs and how we utilize a, a pharmacy. Um, but we always work in teams as well. Um, so many times problems in geriatrics occur because of things outside of medicine. Uh, so people don't get to uh, appointments because they don't have transportation. Maybe they don't have a caregiver at home who can help them do what they need to do. Uh, so besides the medical part of it, we bring in services, uh, so we often work with the social workers, nurses, um, physical therapists, occupational therapists, pharmacists. We have the whole team involved. Now you've halfway answered this question, but why is the Geriatric Fellowship important for South Dakota in particular? We have one of the lowest rates of geriatrician to older people population in um, in the nation. So we, people like doing geriatrics. We don't get paid very well for it. It's probably the least chosen specialty in the United States. In Great Britain, where pay is according to complexity, uh, it's the fourth most chosen uh, specialty. So what we have to do is alter things outside of geriatrics to make geriatrics more successful. Mm -hmm. And then South Dakota is one, to get back to your question, South Dakota is one of the states that has the highest percentage of uh, elderly people. 
Okay. Well, thank you for some very interesting comments about the field of geriatrics, Dr. Oh, Sandberg. you're more than welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sandvik. And welcome back to On Call. Tonight we have Kathy Liedebrandt with Watertown Prairie Lakes Hospital and the Brown Clinic and Robert Summerer with the Madison Community Hospital and Eastern Plains Surgical Department. Thank you for being our guest. Please call in your questions about tonight's topic. Call 1-888-376-6225. Uh, and we'll get right to the first question. This per and we're going to go fast because we've yeah. got a bunch of questions. Yeah. Inclusion body myositis. I think that's probably a brain deal. Do you know any about I'm, that? I'm not sure. On I've heard of it, and that's about the extent of my knowledge. It, uh, and it may be an immune system that's going a uh, problem in the brain. I don't know either. Sure either. Stumped. We're mm -hmm. thinking that would be one for the neurologist or maybe a rheumatologist. All right, and or both. From Branson, we've got. Uh, uh, lady doctor from Sioux Falls for Parkinson's on the program who is a neurologist from Sioux Falls who has been on the show before and who is that Dr. Lisa Viola yeah. and I don't know what about her? what about her who is she Dr. Viola uh, Sioux Falls every year seems a new flu that goes around what becomes uh, flu virus of the previous years are they still circulating or not Kathy I think that's a good question. I don't. I know that uh, it's usually a different one, and the the problem with the vaccine is they have to guess what it's going to look like. Uh, the flu is really sneaky, and it creates its own new coat of antibodies every yeah. year. And so you guess what what it's going to be. The current vaccine, I'm told, is about 60 percent effective. So yeah. even if you've had the flu shot, you can still get, still the, get flu. the flu. Still get the flu. Yeah, but and you most usually don't get as ill with it. That's it. Sioux Falls, are alcohol-based hand sanitizers effect effective against viruses? What do you know about the san sanitizers, Rob? They were pr promoting and doing it in the operating room, right? Oh, right, yeah, and, and uh, we do use alcohol-based sanitizers. It's primarily for bacterial infections, but uh, I believe that uh, it is effective against viruses as well. But it, I, it, it is. I think yes. so. It is, except it is not so effective against uh, a, um, uh, the gastroenteritis. Okay. Okay. So that's the one we have to, if you've got somebody with gastroenteritis, uh, wash your hands with soap and water. Mm -hmm. And then you can use the hand sanitizer too. And think about the places that carry viruses. You know, it's, it's, the, um, it's the typewriter, or not the typewriter, the computer. It's the, it is doorknobs. It is uh, dollar bills. Dollar bills, it's fulmites. And then you spread it to yourself if it's a va gastroenteritis through your mouth if it's a respiratory in your nose or in your eyes. So keep your hands away from your face. And remember your cell phones are also phone Cell mites. phones carry, I mean think about what you did it and then you mm -hmm. reinfect it. Uh, mid 50s woman with bursitis of the left hip cortisone shot 10 months ago really helped but now pain is back, doc hesitates to give another cortisone shot. Am I left with taking aspirin and Tylenol for the rest of my, uh, for 40, the next 40 years of my life? That, that would be one I'd be referring maybe to physical therapy. Uh, there's some really good stretching and exercises that can help. A lot of times the bursitis is, is a reaction to the, uh, the, even arthritis in the knee can cause some radiating pain, change your gait, and but, then... But don't you think also that you can take those shots more often than every 10 months? I yeah. mean, I... Sure. I've uh, seen that used, yeah. Up uh, to three a year is, was our rule, up to three steroid shots in a year. Yeah, four months then. Um, four months. So, I mean, but you, you, I've seen people getting them weekly and then huge doses and then I've seen them become cushionoid. In other words, mm -hmm. the steroid affects them. So mm -hmm. you've got to be careful, of course. I and think of it as a Band-Aid. Uh, the steroid shot may help for a while. It, sometimes it will calm down the inflammation and make it go away, but sometimes you have to do other things to prevent it from coming back. I like the exercise thing that mm -hmm. Jim Hoff was saying earlier. Any other comments? No, I Injection. Uh, Crooks, South Dakota, hemorrhoids. What do I do about the itching and what do you, how do you treat them? Well, when I think of hemorrhoids, um, you know, it's it's really a problem that that uh, is number one goes back to diet and and the original problem, and and it, and it is a physical problem that happens with that. 
with a hemorrhoid, there's there's the the vein, um, and there's actually three big complexes typically that will will potentially prolapse out to the outside, and that allows some of the mucous membrane to come out too, and it brings moisture. And I think that's what most of the symptoms come about is is that moisture. Um, I think products that have witch hazel in it can be really helpful for that. And then uh, going back to a diet, one that's really high in fiber, and I always recommend fiber supplements, and that can really settle uh, uh, hemorrhoid issues down. Okay, yeah. my my recommendation is ground flaxseed because it is greasy and it and it makes it a little bit less. Because uh, if you go to the fi uh, the fiber one or the other. Uh, fiber stuff, it isn't as greasy or slippery, and then it gets irritated, you can't wipe it very well, yeah. it's sticky. So uh, the second thing I like is to cleanse with uh, vanny cream. So you squirt a vanny cream or some kind of cleansing lotion and wipe, with, uh, after you've done your initial wipe, you wipe in that material and then you wipe that away so you don't end up with a moisture uh, uh, barrier there. And then sometimes the best thing after you've cleansed well is zinc oxide ointment. Yeah, I was going to say Desita or well, I Desitin. shouldn't say I shouldn't say, say brand why. names. <laughs> zinc oxide di diaper rash cream uh, yeah. works well. All right, low white count. What do we do for a low white count? Uh, you need to figure out why, usually, uh, and it can be quite a number of things. People who've had chemotherapy in the past will often have low white counts. If they've had an acute virus infection, uh, that can cause it. I just just last week had someone with terribly low white count that it was they were low on vitamin B12, and uh, so the that diagnosis was part of is the, the treatment. Talk to your doctor, yeah. find it out. Well, mm -hmm. if they do know the cause, and a lot of it is myeloproliferative disorder. The bone marrow is kind of pooping out. Or cancer in the bone marrow. Yeah, yeah, and the answer is sometimes you just leave it alone. I know a lot of people promote this very expensive bo white bone marrow, white cell stimulator at a great cost. Do we know that it makes a lot of difference when the white counts 3,000, 4,000, 2,000? Probably not. It's got to get low and you got to have problems. And I wouldn't be alarmed if it was just a one time incident. It would yeah. be something that was chronic before you would want Most to. Most of the time it's yeah. a viral infection. Yeah, if exactly. it's 3,000, 4,000, usually I would check it in a year or yeah. so or yeah. another a few months. Yeah, if there's a problem, that's another story. More exacerbation on uh, anxiety causing lightheadedness. Oh, explain anxiety causing lightheadedness. People over, uh, over breathe. Yeah, I, that's a big part. I think that, and um, I think sometimes your heart goes quicker, and then it doesn't pump quite as effectively. Um, There's a lot, that, you know. And here's this classic story of a hyperventilator. I'm, I'm anxious, I'm over breathing, and then I'm really dizzy. And you come into the emergency room, and they get a paper bag to rebreathe the, to get the CO2 back into the system because they're blowing off their acid or their um, acid, and so they're getting alkaline. The answer I always like is a walk. If you're really short of breath or you're really anxious, a quick walk, you know, a nice brisk walk, great mm -hmm. treatment. Uh, Wakanda, what does, what causes bone marrow to not produce new cells? Bone marrow illness. Well, yeah, it, either, yeah, e either not enough supplies, like not enough iron or not enough vitamin B12, um, uh, or there's something crowding out the usual factory. Some kinds of cancer. Yeah. And um, it, there's, there maybe it turns to fiber. It just kind of burns out. And it's age. Scarred. I was just going to mm -hmm. say age. Old. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Um, here's from Hot Springs. What is your opinion of cortisone shots for sciatica pain? Well, we talked about it. I think it's great, but for three a year, three, four a year. And my experience is again, you you know, for, if you do that for years and years, a lot of times it doesn't isn't as effective as time goes by, and that that's the only concern there. But. For many people, that's the only option, or one of the few options. Uh, what is the, uh, how do you uh, tell what is gallbladder disease? Well, gallbladder disease refers to inflammation of the gallbladder, and there's symptoms that are classic symptoms that we associate with gallbladders, and, and that's pain up in the right upper portion of, of the abdomen, typically. It can also go to the shoulder, can go to the mid-chest, and uh, um, and other places in the abdomen, but primarily it's in that right upper side. Classically, it also occurs after eating, typically from a fatty meal as opposed to, um, you know, a bland diet. Um, and uh, um, 
it tends to last about two to three hours. Um, a lot of people, it occurs in the middle of the night, um, uh, you know, because they've eaten their largest meal on the end of the day. But it's never classic, is it? <laughs> Absolutely not. Right. Yes. What, the fat, right. 40-ish female with floating and feces? Fertile. And fertile. And fertile, yes. <laughs> with floating feces, the uh, nine Fs or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. um, let's, we'll, be, we'll be back in a, in a bit here. South Dakota is now at the widespread flu activity level as of 17th of January. 103 new confirmed cases of influenza were reported last week. 94% influenza A, 6% B. 582 confirmed cases cumulative so far this season. 43 new influenza associated hospitalizations reported this week. 188 hospitalizations so far two new influenza-associated deaths, 11 total deaths in South Dakota for the season, all over 75 years of age. On average, there are 18 deaths each year in the 2004 to 2005 flu season. We had 42 deaths. This is one of the earliest starts to the flu season in record. Most years, it doesn't peak until February or March. I can't encourage you enough to get your flu shot. With 2012 behind us, our thoughts turn to romance. That's right. We're entering a time of year symbolized by none other than the flu bug. Did you know flu season usually doesn't peak until February, sometimes even later? Why take chances? It's not too late to get vaccinated because stopping the flu starts with you. In 1981, during my first month practicing medicine in South Dakota, new partner Bruce Lushbaugh asked me why I hadn't joined the American Medical Association, the AMA. My response was straight from recent newspaper criticism of the organization. I said, the AMA owns shares in tobacco farming property and therefore is hypocritical, inconsistent with its professed mission to do good for the public health. Dr. Lushbaugh countered that in organization of physicians could have great power to benefit the public. And he suggested that if I thought the AMA could improve, I should join it and change it. I should add, the AMA sold the tobacco property shortly after that story broke. Eventually, I did join the AMA and related South Dakota State Medical Association, SDSMA. And aside from bringing doctors together in a joyful social way, I've noted through the years that these organizations have consistently empowered physicians to help our patients. Case in point, the physicians of the AMA and the SDSMA, with others, truly succeeded in reducing tobacco use here and throughout the U.S. The AMA started in 1847 when Dr. Nathan Davis, a young New York doctor, introduced a resolution at the New York Medical Society to establish a national medical association in order to set up standards for medical education, to determine a code of ethics, and to find ways to inform the public about the dangers in non-scientific and quack remedies. These lofty ideals brought physicians to come together that year and organize the AMA. And since this beginning, the AMA has been a tremendous force for enhancing medical education, developing the world's standard ethics manual, and protecting people from charlatan profiteurs. One interesting quack story is that of the 1920s, a radio empire of John Romulus Brinkley, who used the radio waves to get rich by promoting and implanting goat glands under the skin with a false claim to treat impotence. He eventually found a way to prescribe drugs over the air and at the time bargained pharmacies for and received a cut in each prescription. It took the AMA and her vocal executive secretary, Dr. Morris Fishbein, to bring this unethical man and his radio station down. The AMA is here to do good and I'm proud to be part of it. I thought it was appropriate in a general show to say something good about the AMA. You know, we, and, and uh, it gets beat up by a lot of critics. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm a, I'm a member of the ACP, the Internal Medicine Organization, mm -hmm. but I'm also a member of the AMA, and so are both of you. Mm -hmm. uh, your comments about the AMA. 
Well, actually, I, I'm a member of the AOA instead of the AMA, and it's part of the Osteopathic Association, that's right. and oh. so that's that's where my membership is. And and uh, for me, it's it's very much supported my my whole profession, and and actually the the surgical end of it, and and um, you know just maintains uh, a lot of the. Uh, uh, the record keeping um, that keeps us, us, you know, up to date as far as all of uh, the continuing medical education, as well as all the other work that they're doing um, legislatively and, and otherwise. Fifteen yeah. seconds. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a good, uh, good organization. I mean, it working, just working at the grassroots level to make changes for the good of uh, the, the health of the public. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, this brings. Uh, to a close our Ask Anything show. I sincerely thank our guest, Dr. Kathy Liedebrand, a hospitalist with Watertown Prairie Lakes Hospital, and Dr. Robert Summerer, a surgeon with the Madison Community Hospital, for helping answer all of the wonderful questions from our audience. Next week, our panel of doctors will address a variety of questions about fertility and blood clots. So get your questions ready and be sure to join us. I encourage you to visit the BeWellSouthDakota.com website. It's full of information and suggestions that can help you improve that your daily lifestyle could get better. That is BeWellSouthDakota.com. Well, the great American actress, playwright, screenwriter, and sex symbol of the 1930s, Mae West, <laughs> observed, you only live once, but if you do it right, once is enough. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people. Funding for On Call is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call, starting its 11th year of opening doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.